Uh, thank you guys very much. I'm, I'm touched there's so many people here when you're in the middle of exam season. Uh, yeah, I take that, take that as a compliment. Uh, and Charlie, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, it's always, always nice to have the best side of ourselves put forward in an introduction. And uh, I stand sometimes listening to it. But there's always a little part of me that also feels that uh, the guy standing in front of you is often different. You know, I'm often full of nerves, really, and I experience many moments of, of self-doubt as well, you know. And for me, when I look back on so many of these moments, moments of, of like cliches maybe with my life and things that have happened, and when I actually look at what has made the difference at critical moments, I see three really clear, maybe unlikely, uh, things. Three clear words that I, I think define actually so much of, of my journey. But it's been understanding how to master those three things that's also changed so much. And it's those three things that I want to uh, share with you uh, briefly this afternoon. So first, the first of the three words, and uh, arguably the most important word really, and it's this, failure. And this is where I want to start. Stood in the rain uh, at the foot of a windswept mountain in the Brecon Beacons. Uh, and I was soaked, I was shivering, uh, sick with nerves about what lay ahead over the next 11 months. And this was day one of British Special Forces selection to try and join 21 SAS. And we were a band of uh, 90 recruits, uh, or volunteers, as we, were, as we were called by the directing staff. Uh, and if I'm honest, at this point, I'd never felt just so out of place. You know, I was surrounded by these huge, muscle-bound, you know, soldiers who really looked the part, a bit like my good friend who's with me today, Mark. <laughs> nice to have you with us, Mark. Mark's an ex-Aussie SAS guy. Mark is the exception to the rule, and Mark does look the part. <laughs> But I, I just remember this day one, I had that dreadful feeling that I'd really, I'd, I'd, I'd volunteered for something that was way beyond my capabilities. And the first time that I tried for the SAS, after six months of beat up, uh, I was failed. Or returned to unit, as they call it. And the raw truth is, is that I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't good enough. And that truth really hurt, you know. And people often don't know that I failed selection, SAS selection first time round. You know, people tend to gloss over, gloss over the failures. But the truth is for me is that my failures in my life far, far outweigh the successes. You know, many times over, I just have to think of all of these failed expeditions I've done over the years, the failed projects, the, you know, the near-death moments that definitely still come to me in the night sometimes. But I look at those failures and I know they've also made me. You know, they've forced me to adapt and they've built resilience and they've forced me to get stronger inside uh, as well as out. Because as you guys know, there's no shortcut to any of our dreams that somehow magically avoids, you know, failure. Failure's like, a, it's like that doorway. You've got to go through it uh, if you're going to succeed. And for me as a young soldier, I was determined that I was going to retry uh, for the SAS, to go through that selection process once more. And such a big part of me dreaded it. You know, for now I knew what was involved. I dreaded it. I dreaded the blisters and, and the unknown and that kind of fatigue, that deep fatigue. And, but I reapplied. I went through that whole thing once more. And this time, by the end, out of... Um, all of those recruits that stood at the beginning, all those months later, we were down to just four of us. But here's the thing. Out of the four of us that were still standing at the end, three of us had failed at our first attempt, but then got it second time round. In other words, without a failure, there would have been no success. And the message for me is super clear. You've got you to you embrace failure. 
change your mind about it, embrace it, don't, don't, don't run from them, look at them, know the role of failure, treat it as essential markers, and like I said, the doorway that you might have to go through many times if you're going to reach where you really want to get to. So that's the first word, uh, how to deal with the failures, understanding the role of failures in our life. The next word I want to talk about, and this one arguably shapes all of us in some way, and it's, it's this, fear. Because, as you know, life is scary sometimes, and, and all of us, you're going to face battles. And they might be battles of, you know, confidence or nerves. Battles where sometimes you're going to have to face some giants. And those giants can be really scary. But it's a universal truth that whoever we are, life will, you know, life will test you. It's going to test you physically, it's going to test you mentally, it's going to test you emotionally. But how we react to that testing determines so much. Because here's what I've learned, is that life doesn't always just reward the brilliant people. It, it, it's, just, it's just not like that. Life doesn't actually, even though you might not feel it right now, life actually doesn't care that much about the exam results. <laughs> or, the, uh, or the letters after your name, or, or what you look like. You know, life's, life's different to that. Life rewards a dogged, time after time, all through history. Life rewards are determined. Those who somehow, despite those fears, can find a way to walk towards the scary stuff, towards the giants. And after three years in the military, I had a moment that changed my life uh, forever. It was a it was a routine parachuting uh, jump in Africa. It was uh, it was getting dark. Uh, I was falling past four thousand feet. Check that altimeter, time to pull, I throw, deploy, look up, but instantly can see that something is, is very wrong and I'm just struggling to control this thing and, and I'm, I'm falling way too fast. Uh, then I'm too low to use the reserve and, and I just remember bracing for, for impact. And then my world goes, goes silent uh, I, I re remember the African, um, this kind of pretty ropey hospital, uh, and I'm alive, but I, I can't move. And uh, just then, doctors and pain, and, and uh, I'm told that I've broken my back in three different places. And then just a blurred journey home, and, and back in the UK, many months in uh, military rehabilitation. Uh, for me, I think the hard times there were often the night terrors, actually. For me, always about falling, always, always out of control. And then I'd, I'd wake. And it might make you wonder if I've, ever, uh, if I've ever jumped again. Of which, as you guys know, the answer is all the time. All the time. Part of my life. A choice to... Tr try and embrace the difficult stuff and don't get me wrong I dread it I really do I, I, I dread it in here you know and I dread the nights before and then uh, that roar of the, wi the, the wind you know and the door opens like <laughs> for those of you who jumped you, you know what I mean for me it's terrible it hits right in here but I know the answer to my fears you got it you got you got to face you got to face them don't run use it Become like, become friends with it, you know, because life and, and experience has repeatedly told me that if you can edge towards your fears, they often will melt away. So don't run from the difficult stuff. Always keep moving towards it. Own them. Make those things, the very things that frighten you, make them serve you. Because... Fear isn't, it's not a bad thing. It's actually, when you, when you harness it, it's what gives you your edge. So, we've dealt with the failures, trying to find a way through our fears. But now we've got to learn how to turn both those things into, into power. 
And that's where the third word, the fire, comes into it. That fire to, to keep moving forward, you know, against the odds. That fire to, to hang on. That fire to endure beyond what is normal. And it always raises the question, how? How do we do that? How do we find, how, how, do, how do we get that? Because sometimes in life, that fire inside gets a little beaten up. It gets a little hidden. You know, sometimes, sometimes the, that, that, that fire is barely an ember. You know, and you might have had these moments. But here's the thing, it's always there. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're alive and you're breathing, you're beating, it's always there. The faintest of ember. But the fire in your life, if you can learn to harness it and find it, it can change everything. And I remember when I was on Mount Everest, uh, the mountain claimed four of the climbers' lives who were with us up there during that time. Two, two died of the cold and two fell, you know, and it's what high mountains do. They, they beat the hell out of you and they ask that question, what are you made of when you're on your knees, when you're hurting? And I'll never forget the final hours on Everest. We were at 28,000 feet. We'd been climbing now for over 55 days up there. And uh, it's minus 40 degrees. Uh, and we see the dark ice face of the final 2,000 feet looming above us. And, and I'm terrified. You know, I know the next 24 hours from here on is going to change my life one way or the other. But I also know at this point, after so long at, at high altitude, is that I'm weak, you know, really weak. And mentally as well, uh, it, it just, it's just exhausted. And I remember being in this chest deep powder snow, you know, up to here, steep couloir, and this thing is just never ending. And I keep, every time I take a step, I keep sliding back. And, and I reach this point where I'm just no longer sure really no longer sure if I can actually do this. You know, that, that I, I feel it in here and I have this voice that keeps telling me this and it, you know, it, it, it can be loud, that voice sometimes. And slowly I'm bowing to it. But remember, sometimes an ember is all it takes. You know, and I, I just say to myself, I make a decision. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep moving that way. Inch by inch at a time, I'm going to keep going. Just never give up. N G U. And finally, that summit came, and, and you know, I, I remember collapsing to my knees. I think out of exhaustion, I, you know, I was a wreck, and but uh, but I'd made it, you know, just. And we watched the dawn come up over Tibet, and truly aware that uh, we were stood somewhere somewhere special. It was the icy roof of the world, as they say. But the truth is, even though it was icy, the truth is it was a fire, really, that, that, that fire that had got me there. And I look back on so much of my life, and if I took one thing, this would be it, the, the fire. You know, it's been my most valuable weapon by miles, not talent. I don't have a lot of that. Not skills. I've learned a few, but I forget a lot as well. You know, not knowledge, because my brain's weird, and it comes in, it goes out. But resilience. Resilience. And if all you take from our time together in your busy schedule when you should be revising is this, know the power of unrelenting, unwavering resilience. Because it's the very storms of life that everybody goes through. It's the very storms of life that actually make us strong, ironically. And as with all dark nights, sometimes you, you, you just got to, you know, you might be going through it right now, but with those dark nights, you just got to hold on doggedly. You got to trust that the, the dawn will always come. The light is always going to win. And when it comes to fire, as you guys know, in nature, all powerful. Three words that if you can really understand them in your life, they'll empower you. How to deal with the failures that knock so many people back. 
how to deal with the fears that cripple people and they don't do anything. And how to harness the fire. But there's one final element to this talk that um, is important because really reaching the summits of our own mountain, passing your exams, you know, passing selection, writing a book, whatever your, whatever your summit is, should never be a whole story. And this final element is about trying to live with real gratitude and to try and be kind along the way. And, you know, I've had the privilege to climb mountains with men who have lost their legs in war and then never stop smiling. You know, look, just stop for a moment and look at all we have. You know, that gratitude for the good stuff. And it, it comes easier for me now because I've had so many close shaves. I look back on so many times of, you know, I probably count, I reckon, about 20 times that I, I should have lost my life, especially in the early days of filming shows like Man vs. Wild and, uh, you know, many of the early TV shows. I would say 20 is not a number I'm very proud of, but in those early days, we were just like gunning it and going, and it was like we didn't, you know, we just kind of went for it, endlessly bitten by snakes, falling down crevasses, pinned in white water, uh, rock falls. That time in the Costa Rican jungle when I thought it was a good idea to rappel 100 foot down this waterfall with a, uh, using just a vine, and the vine wasn't quite as strong as I'd hoped it to be. Uh, all these things, they, they taught me the simple lessons. Number one, don't be an idiot. <laughs> and number two, always be, always be grateful. You know, and I guess really what I'm, what I'm trying to say through all of this is, is pretty simple. First is that I'm no hero, truly. You know, like, like I, not very articulately, try to say at the beginning, I struggle often. I really do. But I know the weapons that serve me best. And they always come from in here, not just, you know, here. And I guess my hope in all of this is that you only need a couple of nuggets, whatever it is, but somewhere in all of this is something that will keep you going through those dark nights that everybody will go through at some point. But also they'll keep you smiling in the brighter days. But above all, I want you guys to know, stand tall. Stand tall even in the storms. Stand tall. You, you, you are made amazing. And the ember never goes out while you're still standing. It's there. And above all, never give up. N G U. Thank you. <laughs>
And, uh, and I think my family and my friends were amazing, but in a way, the longer the recovery went on and, the slow, and it was slow and it was stumbling and I took a few steps backwards in it, and then you feel guilty that people are being so kind and helping you. And, and that took me a long time to try and find that again. And I think it's why Everest became this huge focus. I thought, do you know what? I'm going to reach that bathroom. I'm going to reach that flight of stairs. I'm going to be able to go down and up twice three times, you know, and, and you build it up and, and I look back now and I think I wonder if I'd ever have had the drive actually to try and make some of these climbing ambitions happen if I hadn't have had that accident in the first place and I suppose what I'm trying to say is you'll all, all go through knocks, you'll all get knocks, setbacks, sometimes you'll feel like your legs are taken from under you, but it's okay. You know, sometimes those times can actually be the making of us, if you can just hold, hold tight. And the progress doesn't have to be spectacular and huge. It can be one step forward, two steps back, but keep keeping moving. Like in nature, when stuff stands still, it stagnates. But you can keep moving, even if you're sliding backwards, you just keep, keep fighting. And fighting and resilience is truly a muscle. You know, it's not something people are born with. It's truly a muscle we can work, and, we're, and like, like the bicep, how do you get the bicep stronger? You break it down, you use it, you use it. And the more we fail, and the, you know, the stronger we'll get through it. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, starting with Everest, you've obviously done a large number of fantastic expeditions, um, been across the Atlantic, been to the Himalayas many times, Antarctica. Is there anything left on the bucket list? What, is, what remains at the top of the bucket list? Yeah, my bucket list is very long in all ways, and <laughs> it is, it really, and it grows, you know, and I, I probably won't get through it in my lifetime, but I want to live with the eyes wide open, heart wide open, come on, let's, you know, and we go to amazing places filming, and sometimes they go, I've got to come back here with the family, we've got to try and kayak this, or, you know, I love to show the, the, our boys this, and, you know, so the bucket list grows, and we work pretty hard at getting through a lot of it, and some we do, some we don't, but, um, you know, full of, full of goals, full of dreams, full of aspirations and, um, and a determination to do it with great people and the people I love. I think that becomes honed more and more. You know, I don't want to nowadays spend so much time many months away for kind of me to plant a flag somewhere. For, I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't drive me. You know, I want to do it with great people. I want to, that's why I love my scouting role or you know, my role with, with the Royal Marine Commandos. You know, anything that encourages young people when they're, they're going through the storms. You know, help them to kind of live with those eyes wide open and a willingness to risk it all and to fail and keep going and the value of friendships beside you. You know, I love that. I have it on, that dynamic I have on Running Wild when we take these, you know, superstars away on adventures. Have it with, with many, many of the things I do and, and I love that. Um. If you're allowed to tell us, where, where is next? Where's the next, next big destination? Well, we, we start the next season, we start uh, filming season eight of Running Wild next week. So we're, we're back into that. Um, that's a show that's been a huge privilege. You know, I, I never thought we'd get to season two, let alone eight. Uh, but you know, r when I say it's a privilege, I really, really mean that. It's, I work with the, my best friends still, the crew, it's a super small crew of like six or eight of us. And, uh, and we go to these places and we get to take some of these incredible global icons and show them the wild and sh show them, you know, have a great adventure with them. And I never take that for granted. So we're back into that. We're doing an, some new shows for American TV, doing more for Netflix and, and Discovery and Nat Geo. So we've got lots of shows on at the moment. In between it, uh, taking the family actually back to, uh, to Everest this year, which has me been a long time dream. Uh, you know, not, 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 not up at all, and they would just try and see the base camp and show them it from the bottom, and that's been a long time dream to take them back. So, um, so yeah. Speaking <coughs> of running wild, who's been the most fun person to take with you? And you don't have to say Obama, um, you can, but. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think the Obama one was, I'm not sure it was the most fun, it was definitely the most stressful. Because <laughs> normally we have a great sort of freedom of like, you know, come on your own, leave the entourage, trust the process, we'll keep you alive, it's going to be amazing. You know, that's basically the kind of, that's the invite, that's the letter, you know, that's the summary. 
But that wasn't really going to wash with Obama and, and, you know, we had a... It was amazing to see the whole kind of Secret Service machine in action. He was still a sitting president at the time. You know, we had helicopters overhead every five minutes and snipers along the mountains in Alaska where we were. And it was pretty crazy. But, um, but he was amazing, you know, at the end of the day, just a, a regular guy, you know, despite this amazing job, obviously, he was in. And I love the wild. It's a great leveller like that. Ultimately, you're, you're two people having a, you know, doing your best and fighting to reach a destination and keep each other alive. Um, I think the most fun was, I don't know, it's not always the most famous sort of ones. I think I get, I get, I get quite nervous with famous people. <laughs> um, so I tend to get much more in the zone of like, come on, we've got to do it. Uh, the fun ones, uh, oh, I don't know, Federer was super fun. And he's, he's mega famous, obviously. But um, I've been a big Roger Federer fan forever, so, so that was a cool one to do. Like Roger? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the goat. The goat. I mean, he, had annoy you know, he was annoyingly brilliant, of course, at everything, having never done any of it before. You know. <laughs> Balance of a bird on all these frozen waterfalls and... You know, super cool guy. So, yeah, ma many, many of them have been... You know, the real fun, if I'm tr honest, for me, the real fun is actually often with the crew afterwards. Because when the guests are there, we're all super focused. We're there to do our job. The guys are being heroes, carrying all the heavy gear, the cameras. Everyone's working hard. We move at a million miles an hour. Everyone's got to be on it. And, uh, and I think afterwards when the guest goes, everyone kind of relaxes. And, the, you know, there's always a few hidden beers and some backpacks. And you can lie by... A, waiting for our evac from somewhere, and it's a brilliant, brilliant time. So I think that's probably the moments I like. Moving on to a slightly more serious topic of conversation, you've been very outspoken about men's mental health and your own struggles with anxiety. Um, do you think that the discourse around men's mental health is changing, and for the better? Um, yeah, I do. I do. It's, it's amazing to see and wonderful to see and important to see. You know, I, I think... I think uh, I almost call it mental fitness, you know, I think it's something we can all do our, do our best to, to equip ourselves with things that are going to help us, you know, day to day. And it's a daily thing, isn't it, to be able to have good relationships, have community, be outside, you know, have, have your bit of mindfulness time or meditation or prayer or whatever you call it. You know, have that focus. Try, try and resist the peer pressures of life. Don't look too much at social media. You know, all these little things, take exercise, try and eat right. You know, all the little things that build up to hopefully giving us a fighting chance of living, uh, living happy lives and, and rich lives. So, um, and I think the conversation around mental fitness is, is wonderful to see happening more, more and more. But, um, yeah, I think, I think that's what I'd say on that, yeah. You spoke earlier about how your favourite thing to do nowadays is, is work with people, particularly young people to get them involved in the wild and adventures. Can you talk to us a bit about your role as the Chief Scout and what that entails, what you enjoy mm. doing? Well, Chief Scout is a great privilege in my life. It really is, you know, as we said at the beginning, 55 million Scouts now around the world, a worldwide force for good uh, of young people like bound together by a common set of values. You know, take an oath to be kind, take an oath to help people. And that's amazing. And uh, in some of the toughest areas, you know, we see incredible stories of Syrian scouts, you know, and Colombia scouts, all d people fighting difficult situations, trying to be kind and helpful. And it's, it's super inspiring for me to be a, a small cog in this incredible machine. Uh, so if you're a scout watching, if you guys, I mean, I'm sure there are many people who have got scouting backgrounds or friends or family have been a scout, well done, you know. And if you're a volunteer, you're a hero. So, yeah, keep going. Do you have a favourite scouting memory of something you've done with the scouts? Uh, I think um, it's the little things, isn't it? You know, we, I go to many amazing big events, you know, like we just had the, the Jubilee, you know, beacons being lit around the country and, and you get all these amazing big jamborees of tens of thousands of scouts. It's always amazing. But I don't know, the little things are the ones that hit me in here. Like when we did this beacon lighting, it was, we found this tree. 70 year old oak tree that had been planted as a little sapling when the queen you know came to the throne and it had a plaque down the bottom and over the years it all just got overgrown 70 years on in lockdown a walker found this plaque sort of half buried and it said planted by the scouts this scout group on this day 1952 and uh, and we found that scout group some of the people who were there at the time that old whole bunch of little young scouts as well 
cleared it, put the beacon there, and lit it as the sun set a couple of nights ago. You know, and to see sort of old and young together and honouring something special and to see the beacons across the horizon lit up and, you know, just a real reminder that we're connected by something wonderful. And uh, I never, t never take that for granted. Um, I think we'll now open up to a couple of questions from the audience. If you have a question for Bear, please put your hand up and wait for our assistant to bring you a microphone. Stand up and ask your question. So if you have a question, please raise your hand now. Uh, the gentleman in the green shirt over there was very quick. So. Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I am an Eagle Scout from Georgia. My question for you is, um, do you prefer fixed blade or folding knives, and do you have a particular model that you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I prefer what knives? Do you prefer fixed blade or folding knives, and is there a particular <laughs> model that you prefer? Uh, okay, so we're getting, here we go. Well, let's have a fixed blade and folding knife conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I always think it's about, uh, it's about the, the operator, not the tool, isn't it? You know, I think that's a lesson I've learned. I've even learned that the best, the best, the best knives still break. <laughs> if you beat it for long enough and use it long enough. Uh, I've actually learned that small is beautiful. Um, and the greatest survival tool we have is always in here and in here. You know, I think it's um, resourcefulness is the blade you want. You know, I mean, you look, Mark, we often talk about, yeah, SAS soldiers are referred to as blades, and it's not because they're, a, you know, an object. It's because they know the, the real edge in our life is always in here. So I think the best blade is always going to be inside here, and use what you've got, improvise. But uh, above all, respect to you. To reach, for those of you that don't know, Eagle Scout is like the special forces of scouting. You know, you've reached the top, but also it's a position of service. And uh, so respect, well done. And it will follow you always. I meet many amazing people who, you know, from Steven Spielberg to whoever who go, come up and they go, I used to be, I was an Eagle Scout. Actually, often the guy used to be an Eagle Scout. And I go, you're always an Eagle Scout. You are an Eagle Scout, you know. So yeah, well done. Do you think that the um, age of sort of mass tourism to Everest has um, reduced the extent to which it is a unique and wild and genuine experience? I, th I think so, a little bit. You know, now you hear amazing stories of, you know, people climbing it in every manner you can imagine. You know, but I think it's important not to be a kind of, you don't want to, you've got to move with the times. You can't be a dinosaur about it. You can't go, oh, you know, my day it was this or that. You know, you, you know it's part of human nature to evolve. And, you know, it's the old adage, improvise, adapt, overcome. You've got to, you've got to go with things. You've always got to be adapting and, uh, and listening as well. So, um, I'm not a kind of critic of any of that, as long as it's respectful to, you know, to the mountains, to the, to the local community and to each other as climbers and, and the right decisions are being made in critical moments like we talked about. But um, it will always be the nature of, you know, we, we want to make everything better and faster and more efficient and the oxygen now is like, you know, we were carrying like these scuba style tanks on it. But now somebody told me the other day they're like down to like five kg or something, you know, so. But it's, and, but it's great, it's great, so um, I embrace all of that, yeah. Um, gentleman here in the green shirt. Hi there, um, great pleasure, thanks so much for, for coming in. Um, I had two small questions, one is, I've always seen you as an advocate for the environment, uh, working in nature. I was wondering, is this something that you're looking forward to getting more involved in? I know that with COP26, you you commented on that, and I know as scouts, there's a promise to the planet. So I was wondering, is that something you're looking forward to, to working in more or becoming an ambassador for? Mm -hmm. And then just second, small question. I see you're wearing on running shoes. I'm in the market for your new running shoes. I'm just a quick question. Are they comfortable or not? <laughs> Cheers. Uh, that's a great, let's ha we'll have, that's a great last question. And we'll, we'll, we'll you wanted to ask one at the end, but we'll, we'll have that as the last one. Because I think it's, it sums up so much of, of the spirit of adventure. You know, adventure loses its power when it becomes about you. Adventure gains its power when it's for something greater than us. And you know, the environmental issue is gonna be all part of all of our lives, whether we like it or not. You know, we're all in the same family on this one ball 
It's called planet Earth. And uh, when we mess up one part of it, we all suffer. But the thing is about the environmental damage is that the people who suffer at the moment are the vulnerable people. You know, the coastal communities that are seeing crazy flooding, extremes of weather, rising sea levels. The, the, the vulnerable, the people it affects most are the vulnerable communities. And I've seen the hard, hard face of climate change close up many times on our, on our filming, you know, whether it's, we did a show called Hostile Planet, looking at the extremes of, of what, it, what climate change means for animals. And all of us, we're all connected. Animals are here, we're all part of this. And, and our job is to fight for what we love. Fight for what we love, you know. And people debate climate change, whether it's this, whether it's that. That's, I always feel it misses the point. The point is simpler. The point is if you love something, you protect it. You know, and that, that comes down to the smallest thing of trying to do the right thing and with not throw trash down and try and minimise the use of plastic. And, you know, none of us are perfect. You know, I have a big carbon footprint. I have many, many things that aren't perfect. But I think it's about, like the scouts say, do your best, do what you can. You know, try. I think generally in our hearts we know the right thing. And, uh, and I think the more we work together, you know, it is definitely not too late. That's what I'd all say. The world is fragile, but also resilient. It's not, not too late. So, uh, and I get so inspired by the stories of so many young scouts determined to make the environmental issues front and centre, not just of their day-to-day, -day, but of their life. You know, they want to work in the profession now of environmental sciences. We've just launched a GCSE in this country uh, of natural history, you know, and protecting the environment, and it's brilliant. Young people wanted it. They want to be, to be able to, you know, have an influence and make a change. So that is what I'd, I'd say, but we're all in it together, yeah. And, and to young people and scouts wanting to, you know, make that change, go for it, go for it. The, the, you're, you're the salvation of the, of the planet is already here. We just haven't found it yet, you know, but we've all got to do our bit as much as we can. And then the second question was, Shoes. Oh, the shoes. <laughs> shoes are super comfortable, yeah. yeah I've, I've got so many old injuries, you know. My, anything that helps, knees, you know, ankles, back, you know, I'm always in. And, and these, are, these are great running shoes, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stand up and be an advert for running shoes, although they are very nice. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, very good shoes. <laughs> I'm afraid that's all that Bear's got time for uh, this afternoon, but one question from me, which I ask all of our speakers at the end of the talks, is if you could, in four or five sentences, give one piece of advice to the members of the Oxford Union and Oxford University, what would it be? Three words. You know what they are. <laughs> N, G, U, never give up. Come on, team. Go smash your exams. You guys are amazing. Thank you.